Okay, so let's begin with the biggest news in the world. Trump's been indicted for, I guess, <laughs> illegally storing um, federal documents. Um, or I guess doing it in an unsafe place or fashion. Uh, it's so, it's so ridiculous. I mean, I'm not a Trump person. If you've listened to the first two uh, transmissions, not a Trump supporter. I'm not even really a big defender. I'm just, obje- you know, being objective about who he is and why the deep state. You know, D.C., America's globalist, uh, Zionist-occupied government hate him so much. Why? It's just, uh, it's a trumped-up charge. I mean, yes, I guess he's guilty of that. But, I mean, 47 counts, they've done all of this to punish him and stop him from running again. And it just seems pathetic. It seems like overkill. And it seems like... America saving face because they are scared and they are probably, you know, sincerely pissed at this guy for reasons I've already explained, you know, but let's, you know, let's go into it. The thing is liberals, you know, Democrats have been brainwashed into hating this guy and they've been brainwashed to believe Oh my God, he's he's the next Hitler. He's that was the original. Remember that was the original charge when he was running for president. He's Hitler. He's going to, you know, take all your freedoms away, and he's going to come after Jews, and he hates black people, and he hates women. All this stuff, it's stuff that they were guilty of themselves, you know, on the the Democratic elite or the DNC. And I mean, how is he any different from any other Republican or any other politician uh, in his generation? But why, you know, they win. I mean, here there's a grain of, yeah, a a kernel of truth in that. Um, He is a Christian white nationalist. He is a John Birch Society plant. I know I covered that, you know. He comes from that same camp as the Tucker Carlson and, and, and the Alex Joneses and, you know, this kind of anti-communist, uh, right-wing, conservative, uh, military-industrial complex. Because they are totally just about, they're just, a, you know, they are all about profit. They profit off of anti-communism and patriotism and you know, telling Americans they're victims, but they do want a seat at the table of the New World Order, and they do want, uh, they are, they have a small piece of the deep state to be this far, but they're not, they're kind of like the outsiders, the minority in the deep state, and that is what they're mad about. They don't really care about democracy or you know, preserving the Constitution. Maybe there's, you know, they kind of believe in that, but that's, you know, that's just their platform. And Trump is the guy that they brought in. I'm really describing a lot of Freemasons, like modern Freemasonry, because obviously most American Freemasons know what they serve and they know what the Illuminati is and they know about the New World Order. A lot of them are for it, but a lot of them like I just said, want to reform it. They want to make it more American and white nationalist. You know, they they know that they are serving, they know that their organization protects and serves globalism and they're trying to take it back to some more kind of classical liberal, the, the fantasy that they were sold. And I mean, that's why, like I've already talked about, there's Kubrick and James Cameron, they were Freemasons from my vantage point, everything I've, all the evidence I've seen, and there are tons of other Freemasons, and Trump is probably a Freemason, and Vince McMahon, like I brought up, a Freemason, but I mean, they all kind of slant more towards centrism, you know, true centrism, classical liberal shit, because they want, 
they they go along with the program, but they want to subvert it and make it a little more America oriented. I mean, because yeah, they're America first. That's their whole thing. They're just like these because they joined as like uber patriots and they believe that lie. So, like I said, you know, they're sworn to secrecy and they're trying to take. They're trying to use capitalism and manipulation and all the things that the Illuminati do, but to serve themselves, profit themselves. And that's a big no-no, obviously. David Lynch, throw him in there. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, but Trump... So, yeah, I do believe he is this Christian nationalist who is against the deep state and globalism to an extent. But I believe from everything I've seen, he was not a willing, conscious Putin puppet, as they say. I mean, he, here's the thing. He is the Putin puppet that the Democrats claim. That is, that's be, after the Nazi thing stopped working, they just started calling him a Putin puppet because that really is why the deep state and the liberal elite and the globalist hate him. He's he is being, he was, and yeah, he was exploited by Russia and China to help him. They wanted him to be elected. They, I doubt he worked with them in any, you know, criminal or um, close, um, yeah, fashion. It, you know, there's, there's no evidence of it. They went years trying to prove it. That was a total waste. They never had... They never apologized or admitted all the tax money and fear-mongering that they did with Russiagate. But yes, Russia and China obviously wanted him to be president because he is a nationalist like them. He did not want to... He wanted to make trade fair with them so America would stop being exploited and destroyed by uh, globalist design. But he also wanted to ease tensions with them and have a you know, just a, a friendly kind of economic uh, relationship with them. And I mean, I guess in a way, maybe he was consciously helping BRICS. He wanted them to get away from the American dollar. That's for debate. It doesn't even matter because why would that make him a criminal or a bad person or a bad president? You know, he sensed it's possible he sensed America, being America first is um, getting away from the U.S. dollar and the corruption of the Illuminati and stuff like that. I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, if he is this Christian nationalist uh, sort of, you know, I, com comparatively progressive, even left-wing Freemason, yes, he would consciously be working against the Illuminati but in a very, you know, in a very strategic, moder moderate, kind of right-wing way. And that's why he's being punished. That's why they're going after him. So, I mean, yes, he is probably the best president we've had since Kennedy. And in a way, probably better, more successful. Um, definitely not as damaging. Because, I mean, come on, Kennedy was a right-winger and a you know, a war hawk and all these things. And he let the beast out of the fucking, you know, <laughs> out of the, the, the cage. That is the CIA and the New World Order and all of that. And he got killed, so he failed. Trump, Trump, you know, this is going to be a very hotly debated thing. Intentionally or not, he has hurt the New World Order worse than anyone else, any American ever. And it's it's an uh, incredible thing. I mean, they can't, that's not, that's treason to the New World Order. That's not treason to America. That's the thing. It's like he is a real patriot, you know. Um, but yeah, they're coming after this guy. And yeah, I mean... Yes, okay, Democrats, he is a Putin puppet. Who cares? Do you know who the, you know, like Obama and Biden? Do you know who Biden is a puppet of? I mean, 
pure, unadulterated, anti-human, you know, evil. You can't say that about Trump. Um, so, yeah, it is sad. I mean, this was uh, the Republican Party's best guy. Um, and now you see RFK Jr. coming up. I believe RFK Jr. is the this, this group, this uh, kind of alternative deep state, this minority deep state. I believe this is their guy. I think that they, I mean, look at it. You got Elon Musk getting behind him. Come on. That is letting you know right there that, you know, uh, some New World Order Freemasonic people want this guy. Some influential people want this guy in there. And, I mean, he really is coming out of nowhere. And, I mean, he is so right-wing in most of his platform. He's not really progressive in any way besides... You know, uh, being a na- comparatively nationalist and against, you know, he he you know he sees the the eugenics and of the new world order. He seems to be against it. And he's probably for imperialist wars, capitalism, Zionism, all these things. But I'm probably you know. I hate to say it, he's probably weaponizing those things against uh, greater evils. You know, the people that control those things, who are manipulating those things. So I don't know. I don't know if it's a... Who's, who knows what's going to happen to Trump? Who, I, I, I kind of feel bad for the guy. And I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really... Def- I guess I am maybe defending him a bit. I mean, it is what it is. Just because he's not as evil as they say, what are you supposed to do? Oh my God, a right winger, a Republican wasn't bad. Why should that upset left wingers? That should be, it upsets left wingers because it shows the left and the Democratic Party, the liberals have, are totally corrupt and useless. And it shows you have to go to the Republican Party to you have a better chance of getting things done it's pretty crazy so why is Kennedy running as a Democrat that is the biggest red flag right there so far he's not saying anything that uh, he's not saying anything different from I guess like a, a Trump or just your average Democrat really you know He's got he's got some of the better qualities of a Trump or a MAGA person, but he has all the same negatives of a of a Republican and a Democrat. The thing is, RFK Jr. is not as good and pure and um, intelligent, in my opinion, as. JFK Jr. would have been, you know, they they killed JFK Jr. There's a great documentary called Dark Legacy 2. Uh, the part one was about JFK's assassination and how George Herbert Walker Bush was totally responsible for it. Dark Legacy 2 proposes that JFK Jr. was killed to allow George... W. Bush, you know, Jr., to become president because they saw JFK Jr. would become a, he would be the perfect president. He would reform the Democratic Party, stop neoliberalism, go after all these people, do all the things RFK Jr. wants and should do, but I just don't have any confidence in RFK Jr. Uh, JFK Jr. was a real guy. He knew exactly who killed his family, just like RFK has come out and exposed the CIA, and I think he's even admitted, you know, brought up the mob and stuff like that. But I don't think, I don't know. It doesn't seem like, JFK Jr. saw the anti-communism behind it. He saw the Zionism behind it. JFK Jr. just, he saw the whole thing mapped out, and he was the perfect appealing candidate. RFK Jr., 
I just don't. I just don't see it. I mean, he, he it's possible he's going to... He could win. He could steal it somehow if he has the right backing. He's more popular than Biden. And, I mean, he's got the backing of the most influential right-winger. or Yeah, and Elon Musk, the richest man in the world. That's something. But he's so controlled. Ugh. I really haven't seen JFK come out against, you know the more totalitarian things that the Democratic Party is doing, you know, the identity politics and the woke culture, the transgenderism and stuff like that. He's, I haven't seen him simp for it, but we've seen he's a spineless guy. He might just go along with it to placate uh, the Democrats. I mean, that's who he's going to placate and serve. We see he's, he's, you know, he's not going to really contend with the Republicans that much. He's not going to contend with the Democrats that much. They're the main ones he's going to be serving. And so you know left-wingers are going to be the last on his friggin' list of, uh, you know, of, of, of allies. And so mm, I don't want to rag on RFK. It's just, it, it's kind of a depressing topic. The guy is afraid of getting killed. You can just see it every time he talks. He has like all this fear in his voice, and you can tell he's, you know, he, he's he's thought of every frigging angle how they could kill him. He's thought of every rule to avoid breaking. But what is his end game? The fact that it, he hasn't really explained that leaves hope, but it's also so vague that it's kind of ominous, like. You know, it, you know, it, it just it. We we don't know his plan. We don't know how well he can execute it. I'm sure he spent his entire life thinking of getting some kind of revenge on the people who killed his father. That is the he's all he's all he cares about is like the CIA and organized crime. I mean, that's good. That is good. That is more concrete and and. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's it's a it's a better start than what Trump had in mind, which was like I'm gonna drain the swamp. And he he didn't do that. He had some um, ulterior motives, and I'm you know Ken- Kennedy has his ulterior motives because he is not one of these guys. But he seems controlled, man. He seems controlled by like the the, the same kind of the same kind of handlers that Trump had. And let's talk about who they they might be because Trump to me is a Manchurian candidate. And that's funny because that ties right into Kennedy again. To those unfamiliar, Manchurian candidate is a novel turned into a very influential movie about a conspiracy, it's like the, you know, foundational conspiracy thriller where a right-wing politician is programmed by Chinese and Russian communists to kill uh, a right-wing presidential candidate so his communist secretly communist um, running mate will take his place and you know it's basically just like oh how communists are you know communists within America are you know conspiring and trying to take control and they manipulate right-wingers to do it I think Trump is a Manchurian candidate. I think it's probably, if it's not communist, some subversive American group, entity, whatever, used him to help China and Russia. You know, he was the fall guy. And he probably, you know, I'm sure he didn't know it. I'm sure, and I'm, I... I'm for it. 
I'm for, f I, guess, I don't know, that, that might be controversial, foreign and foreign intelligence manipulating and using American right-wingers to help their own cause. I mean, it's just self-defense and it's revenge because, I mean, how much has the American government, or at least the CIA, not so much the American government, but kind of rogue entities within, criminals within, they've sabotaged and assassinated and co-opted movements all over the globe. And it's like, ah, their biggest fear was it happening to them. <laughs> you know, that's just karma. That's how the universe works, man. That's how Allah, God works. That's how it operates. What you put out comes back to you. You know, the same energy you put out and into other people that influence the pain or the joy you inflict on them is going to come back to you. And then it, it matters who you, the energy, it's not just the energy you put out, but to whom that energy is given. That's the difference between Buddhism and Islam. Buddhism is just like, oh, you do good and bad, it comes back. No, if you do good for a bad person, bad is going to come back to you. If you do bad towards a good person, bad is going to come back to you. If you do good towards a good person, good's going to come back to you. And if you do bad towards a bad person, good will come back to you. I've seen a lot of convincing evidence that there is a deep-seated and long-reigning communist element within American politics, not the American government or even DC, but there have been cells and and just all these communist sympathizers, like uh, families, political lines. For example, surprisingly, Kamala Harris, her family were Marxists, and it, it's 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 like that. It's like little governors and attorneys and these upper class political families who work within the Democratic Party have never really had any real power. But they are essentially communist agents. And they're, you know, it's a handful. It's nowhere near the exaggeration uh, that the right wing, you know, specifically the John Birch Society right wingers, Republicans put out. Like most, 99% of Democrats are anti-communist. But... Yes, there are people, obviously, communists within, and they're, they're crypto, they're very covert about it. They are about bringing communism to America. They are not anti-America, and they're not even pro-Russia and pro-China or pro-USSR. They were just pro-communism and had mutual goals and mutual enemies. And it's funny because to get this kind of information, you have to go really, really deep within the right wing Republican. And I'm, you have to like, you have to find like old school Republicans, kind of fringe Republicans who were influenced by the John Birch Society, but also recognize that it's controlled Zionism um, and communist possibly <laughs> influenced. Um, they're they're the real kind of they're the only real right wingers that I get any kind of good information from listening to. And they're not the alt right. They're not like Christian. Well, I think they might be Christian nationalists, but I don't have, actually haven't really seen that. I think that they maybe in a reactionary way they're like just to be anti-communist and nationalists, they'll be Christian white nationalists or whatever. But the, the, the point is, Trump was used not even so much as a Putin puppet, but as a Chinese puppet, a Manchurian candidate. <laughs> and I mean, how can, they're punishing him for, for that and they found 
you know, this trumped up charge to punish him for it. And it's like, I feel bad for him. If he was a willing participant, he's a hero in my book and, and a real, you know, criminal to America at the same time. But if he did it inadvertently, I feel bad for the guy, but also not bad because he didn't know the good he was doing. <laughs> Uh, so either way, uh, you know, come see, come saw. Poor Trump. Hopefully he gets away with it because I mean, he didn't really do anything compared to, you know, the real evil people get away with. Hillary did the same thing, much worse. She got rid of evidence for, you know, basically letting American soldiers get annihilated. <laughs> But what's interesting about the Manchurian Candidate is the film version is probably one of the most important things a conspiracy theorist needs to decode and understand. And that film came out a few years before JFK was assassinated, but it is about the JFK assassination. It is predictive programming. It is CIA propaganda. I've already explained how that's possible, how the CIA has controlled Hollywood and media from their inception. They were created for that purpose, to spy on American citizens and foreign governments and to control us with lies, propaganda. So, the Manchurian Candidate film, you know, stars Frank Sinatra, who's a very close uh, friend of... JFK helped him get elected because he had mob ties. Um, he was actually friends with the head of the mob, Sam Momo Giancana, who, of course, rigged the Chicago election, the Democratic primaries in the Chicago, in the, you know, the Chicago uh, primaries to help to clinch the win for JFK. And JFK, his family already had mob ties, and he wanted to cut those ties. He, went, he just used them to get her elected. And that made Kennedy feel, I mean, that made Sinatra feel used, and JFK cut ties with Sinatra because of his mob ties. You have to understand this was an era where Americans were just learning what the mafia is and how powerful they were. They, they ran every freaking city. And people didn't know what they really did. They just thought they were like these depression era entrepreneurs <laughs> who were just flossing and worked together in business. Those were just fronts. They were obvious, obviously organized criminals. And, you know, the FBI was created, not created, but the FBI really made its name taking down organized crime. And so... The CIA worked closely with the FBI. I mean, with, the CIA worked closely with the mafia and used them to get things done. And they would use, the CIA would contract the mafia to kill JFK because of the animosity and the betrayal that JFK did to the mob. And it's much deeper, you know, they, the mob killed Marilyn Monroe and she was actually a CIA honeypot agent and the CIA and FBI believed that she had communist ties so she was expendable to them but before any of that how she became a CIA and agent and a Hollywood movie star is because she was actually the mall of Momo she was basically just oh, his whore. She slept her way to the top. She was his girlfriend, prostitute. He used her to get information and get power over people, that being JFK and, and RFK. And, you know, the, the government and the mob killed her trying to frame one or both of the Kennedys 
and you know to stop them from getting reelected or I guess uh, or, yeah I think so or just to get them actually impeached I think and it didn't work uh, the frame up didn't work because there are elements of the CIA and FBI who were good then and they kind of warned JFK got him to sidestep it and this is when JFK really knew it was on and they were coming for him but back to the Manchurian candidate the Manchurian candidate Frank Sinatra plays the best friend of the Manchurian candidate this politician who's being used to by communists to serve them and that has always been the government's that's always been the false narrative that the government, the CIA has put out was that, oh, JFK was being used by the communists. Uh, that's why he, 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 he stood down again in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was, he was actually a patsy, a puppet for the communists. So that's why we had to take him out. And that is, that's what they tell each other because they can't just say, oh, he was against the New World Order, so we had to kill him. They lie and say, well, he was... He was a good man, but he was a fool who was used, being used by communists, so it was patriotic to just murder him. You know, this is what the CIA's top people believe. They believe that it was a good thing to kill him because he was this anti-American. He was, you know, he got in with the wrong crowd and was used like, like they, he was a Manchurian candidate. So that's what they tell you, you know. The Manchurian candidate was put out as Got Hollywood propaganda so people would be okay with the assassination of their own leader and they would use this excuse like obviously he was a communist he had to be taken out and that's always been the Re Republicans view on it is like he was a communist JFK needed to be taken out they just stopped them from questioning ironically it's been Republicans in the last 20 30 years who've been questioning the JFK assassination because they've seen the deep state and the corruption and they've questioned the narrative it hasn't been democrats except for the kennedy family that's really it who they were the democratic party's royalty every time you know bill clinton ken uh biden obama these guys got elected by just pretending to be kennedy by using the same you know dogma and performance and, and even parts of the same of Kennedy's speeches that word for word they've just bastardized and co-opted Camelot like oh we're gonna you know take you back to 19 was it 63 we're gonna go back in time and was it 1950 I, what, what year was it I'm confused what year did they kill him it doesn't really matter it's not important to the you know topic but yeah, I mean the Democratic Party, that is the that is where the Democratic Party became corrupt, the murder, assassination of Kennedy and the creation of neoliberalism, people who were down with the murder of Kennedy. You know, all every single one except for maybe Carter, who wasn't a great president, every single big democratic uh democrat party elite has been a neoliberal who knows who killed Kennedy and they're cool with it and they're cool just you know aping the Kennedys to get that power and serve the the pyramid but you just you you need to watch the Manchurian Candidate because it's so blatantly obvious and it's so insidious that Frank Sinatra at the very end of the film has does like this eulogy where he's just like he was my friend he was a great man, but he ran in with communists, and so it was my patriotic duty to take him out. Frank Sinatra totally was a willing participant in the cover-up, and he knew they were going to kill Kennedy. I mean, he was a mafia-made man. He was inside. He knew what they were going to do to his friend. And I mean, I understand he's a criminal, and it wasn't even his call, probably, but it's just like, wow. Frank Sinatra is not a good guy. Ironically, after that, he became like this, you know, super icon based on, you know, his friendship with Kennedy. And like I said, Kennedy wasn't even really that cool of them. He just kind of used him for political purposes. And they, you know, 
screwed, you know, mob uh, chicks together, prostitutes, not knowing a lot of them were honeypot agents. And you have to understand, Marilyn Monroe is essential to the MK Ultra and pro well, actually, Oswald was a victim of MK Ultra, but M Monroe Marilyn was a huge. Um, she's she's almost like the prototypical monarch victim, you know. Lots of sexual trauma, girl from the middle of nowhere, remade. You know, the the reason they use the monarch butterfly is because it's a symbol of reincarnation and rebirth. Because they take these girls and boys, you have very young children. They use them a lot for this, for CIA recruitment. That's how you make a CIA deep state, deep, uh, black ops soldier. Is they take these traumatized kids. They would take kids, let adjacent um, satanic cults that they were cool with that they just like they're cool with the mob they're cool with these satanic cults they would use them to traumatize children abduct and traumatize children then bring them in save rescue them transfer them to these government facilities and training uh you know yeah like basically deep state spy training operations remake them program them give them new identities like a monarch like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly and for men yes they sexually abuse little boys and turn them into like murderous uh basically new knights templar and that's that's always been how the top of the freemasonry has worked sodomy you know they've, they've always known sodomy is good at breaking a man's spirit and uh, making him submissive to another man and getting him like sexually and physically and mentally dependent on servitude. So of course it works the same way with women. They do it to, and they've used that for uh, pop music, Hollywood, and Marilyn Monroe is this. There's nothing more obvious than that. After that, you know all of the kind of white supremacist imagery of like the super blonde buxom childlike woman who's half naked all the time is all obviously drunk and high all the time uh sleeps with many many different men uh does anything for attention all of that was curated i mean they gave her that psychology obviously with her experience being a prostitute and sleeping her way to the top for the mob and the CIA they they conditioned her to be like that they they find people with you know susceptible psychology and make them worse turn them into agents and <clears throat> i mean i've just described like every freaking pop star since i don't know elvis <laughs> it's messed up but it's true michael jackson uh, Britney Spears, oh my gosh, all of these new rappers, just, uh, it's crazy, Mariah Carey, whose album was called Butterfly, I believe, oh, and Madonna's lame ass, you know, so we really need, if you're a leftist and you're listen, listening to this, you really need to go out of your comfort zone stop listening to democrats start listening to right-wingers with you know an open mind see what try to find information everywhere but you need to understand the mainstream poli political uh venues which are at this point like 90 percent democrat and liberal they're total lies they're total government uh disinfo uh, facilities you know S seriously and it's like why do we need an alt left for nationalists for progressives for the religious for so called turfs you know radical feminists who are trans exclusionary and 
swerfs who are you know feminists who are anti-sex work you know because it's all part of the pyramid everything that we're against we need to get all these groups together but in the interest of american communism i mean maybe that's all being operated you know that's being operated there is an alt left that's already existed we're not it's it's so it's so covert and protected that it's almost a cult but it is definitely different uh from free me well you know the more I think about it it's possible that there is an element of um, these guys in freemasonry but i doubt it i i, I imagine the top american communist you know leaders and leagues have origins and memberships in freemasonry but I, they have to be the tiny minority because more and more freemasons would be against them you know they would be speaking out with more clarity and urgency about american communists and who they are Instead, they're focused on George Soros and all these guys who are foreigners and, you know, Jews. They're not even, they wouldn't even need to be Masons. You know, I, I, I believe like a David Lynch, I've already said, is a communist. Um, not communist, a Freemason, but he, his, his, he's more worried about fascism and the white nationalist even though I believe he is a white nationalist, but he's more worried about like the fascist takeover and liberal authoritarianism than communism. Communism specifically is something separate from the globalist neoliberal neocon uh, agenda. And a lot of Republicans don't understand that because they have these Masonic John Birch Society Republicans putting everything on communism instead of the deep state that they're trying to join. You know, why do I hate why do I hate the American left, mainstream left so much? Perfect example this week. Oh boy, I mean, this is being recorded in Pride month and some Canadian Muslims were filmed um, getting their children to stomp on, you know, child-oriented rainbow pride LGBT flags and propaganda. You know, all this rainbow-covered stuff for kids. And I saw thousands, I think a post had like 65, 85,000 likes about like, oh my gosh, these Muslims, they are groomers. They should have their children taken away. They are godless, anti, you know, anti children. They're hate. They're a hate group. I saw a popular post saying that, just total xenophobic popular post. Like these people shouldn't even be allowed here. They should go back to their own country. This is coming from so-called progressive millennial leftists who are gay, total fascist speaking. They're saying the stuff that. A lot of American Republicans don't even say about Muslims. Like, go back to your country. You're bringing your evil anti-liberalism here. I mean, when you think about it, Republicans, yes, they're Islamophobic because of 9-11. They're, they're Islamophobic because Islam is anti-Christian. They're not. And it's, it's the Democrats who are more Islamophobic because Muslims are anti-liberal. An anti-globalist and all of these an anti-gay but let's let's go into that our when you really look at it yes it's 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 true uh, Islamic countries do have killed you know have public executions of gay people and homosexuality is homosexuality is a crime most places but when you really look at the that's Sharia law that's how man has interpreted uh islamic texts to rule their governments when you look at the quran the actual con the one holy concrete text for all muslims the only thing that all muslims uh agree and must serve and obey it's kinder to 
homosexuals than Christianity and Judaism. Fact. In, in Judaism, homosexuals are to be killed. And what is it? In Christianity, uh, are they to be killed? Well, I mean, Christianity adopts Judaism. Christ didn't really speak on homosexuality, so you have to just go by Judaism, where it's an abomination and they need to be uh, physically harmed and killed. There's none of that. There's nothing in Islam saying you should harm a gay person. Yes, it's unnatural, and you're prohibited from promoting it socially, but you should not harm or punish a gay person. You're supposed to harm uh, adulterers. You're supposed to harm pagans who, you know, serve Satan. You're not supposed to harm a Jew or Christian or a a gay person unless they're harming you. They are actively trying to, at war, physical war with you. And the self-defense nature that differentiates Islam from Judeo-Christianity, that's what led the post, these, not just post- Jesus, but also post uh, Muhammad rabbis to develop the extremist Zionism within the Talmud, which is, oh, you can break every friggin commandment if it's to defend a Jew from a non-Jew. You know, it's it's there. It's so much more vicious. It's it condones pedophilia. It can condones uh, uh subversion and espionage and murder and lying and everything it's just that's why they act like that that's why they are so two-faced and false and conspiratorial and genocidal and racist and all this stuff the talmud not the torah so they're not even real jews that's the thing it's like how can you be anti-semitic when these people don't come from jews they don't practice judaism they're called jewish because they're not jews but let's keep it a buck about homosexuality because I am a Muslim and I'm going to be very clear and I'm going to be very sympathetic and very objective and very honest. Homosexuality is not eve. It, well, how do you put it? Like they say, we hate the sin. We do not hate the sinner. You can't hate or blame a gay person for something that they did not choose. It's a myth that they choose homosexuality. It is. It develops in these people you know you're kind of ultra liberal would argue with these they would propose the very very recent and unscientific theory that uh, there it's hormones in the mother that uh, stops children from becoming Heather sex that, that makes no sense because there's no, we can't find a gene that influences sexuality. It is not, um, I mean, we know that chemicals, yes, there can be chemical causes for homosexuality and gender dysphoria and hermaphrodism and all that stuff. But there's no gay gene. Most scientists agree that there's no gay gene. So how could a mother's, you know, chromosomes create a a gay child, a child that has uh, opposite homosexuality. It is a mental development. It is a psychological aberration. Everyone is born to reproduce. Everything is made to reproduce. Homosexuals are made to reproduce. Something goes wrong with their psychology. And we can go to, you know, the, the, some, the research of Freud and better yet Lacan who came after and you know it is the same homosexuality is, homosexuality is not a fetish but the same way fetishism develops is the same way homosexuality develops in the, the Oedipal stages of you know from like a, a, a from infancy to a toddler you know early childhood all those different stages where you're your libido is developing and attaching to stimuli and people around you. It's, it's, you know, parents don't, 
y- yes, it's true. You can turn a child gay, but it's it's not so much like oh their their parents didn't love them or someone diddled them. Even though those things have been, you can see it. You can see that is the what happened to a lot of gay people. We know this sexual trauma, but most of the time they're just attaching to you know um they're attaching to the wrong parent or you know other adults or maybe like a you know tv images but mostly they're they're not seeing men and women their parents or just you know men and women so in society performing the proper gender roles capitalism has screwed everything up where you have women being dominant and careerist and acting like men and not reproducing and not becoming mothers and you have men becoming just weak and submissive to women and you know they have to pay for sex and all this like they're they're becoming feminized and that backward and this is all from liberal capitalism backed by of course you know conservatives and republicans it's it's if the system is breaking down the same way the economic system is breaking down the sociological system is breaking down norms are breaking down and it's affecting the kids and the people who are denying that they're the groomers man they're the main groomers there yes there are groomers within the gay community who are just actively out there grooming kids because what is homosexuality it is rejecting sex for re- reproduction and solely embracing sex for pleasure that's why you know like bi- you have bisexuals they're they're just like hedonist and narcissist who see sex t- you know for for both and they they just have weight uh, uh, an unhealthy slant for pleasure I mean, gays, that's all they do it for, you know. But you still, everyone is born, like I said, everyone is born with the reproductive instinct. Theirs is just like broken and uh, underdeveloped and arrested. They still have it. Homosexuals still have reproductive instincts. What do they do? Non-sexual reproduction. And what is that? Grooming children. And this is a hard fact. Most, not most, but autistic people have a higher degree, much higher degree of homosexuality and transgenderism and queerness. And what's comorbid with that is oppositional defiant disorder, ODD, odd. (laughs) Which is basically like just doing the opposite and getting like a, it's a, it's it's a psychological gratification, but I would argue it's a psychosexual gratification because if you're oppositional to everything and you get pleasure from being oppositional, you get oppositional, you, you get pleasure from being oppositional about sex. And that's what a lot of homosexuality is. It's, it's true. And if you have oppositional defined disorder and you have autism and you can't understand social norms and you're emotionally cold to the feelings of others and also homosexuals have a high or a degree of narcissism or at least narcissists have a higher degree of homosexuality they can't process that it's not cool to groom other people's kids to homosexuality they don't they it just doesn't process you can't they're they're as was uh, I think Charlie Murphy said, they're habitual line steppers. They don't care about boundaries. They they can't even empathize with heterosexuals. You say you can't preach butt sex and you can't preach sodomy to children and say this is normal. You can't talk to other people's kids about sex. They you it just it it will never register to these people because they're basically emotionally they're children that's why they're called gay they've always been called gay because they're like stunted you know children they're like they have an arrested development that's all homosexuality is 
their their sexuality is stunted at a certain level they didn't they didn't form their home their heterosexuality got confused and broken and focused inward that's why they're so narcissistic they're attracted to their own image they're trapped attracted to their yes they're attracted to their own image because there is a mirror stage in the edible complex in the edible development and they get they they get hyper focused in the mirror stage I and mean, look at it seriously you see heather homosexuals with partners that look just like them or they're obsessed with fitness or they're obsessed with partners who are you know all about image and fitting an image and stuff like that when i'm talking about like the butch lesbians they're with the super femme lipstick lesbians who are just kind of like a cartoonish version of femininity and they put on this cartoonish version of masculinity to attract those lipstick lesbians to me liberals are so much more homophobic one because you know they're letting they're enabling the grooming and they you know treat them as Brett Bre- Bre- Easton Ellis a great homosexual kind of conservative a uh, novelist once said liberals treat gays and gays want to be treated as gay baby pandas they want to be these fragile little snowflakes who never questioned and get away with everything like you know children <laughs> that's what's so creepy there so many of them and I, it's so it's 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 toxic and wrong to just you know say most of them are um pedophiles or you know prey on children they're groomers they groom children towards homosexuality and a huge number of them capitalize on that and abuse children to get their homosexual uh tendencies out but that's really just about that's an argument for pride in my opinion pride should not be i think pride is the wrong word because pride is a sin <laughs> um but a healthy kind of um self acceptance and self love because if you don't have homosexuals being out then they're going to be in the closet and they're going to prey on children because you know they're the easiest to groom and confuse and children are you know susceptible and trusting and like you're seeing with all this grooming they they'll buy anything people talk about the the extremist parents teaching their kids to be homophobic that's a reaction to homosexuals since you know ancient times grooming children to be their sexual slaves i mean this is such a huge part of freemasonry because it's a huge part of the satanic elite who've ruled since you know our pagan roots in primal communism yes you need to understand we were communists before we were anything and that's you know we're what we're trying to get to is you know a global communism advanced technological communism just like the illuminati and the satanists want the atlanteans in my opinion the same way they want to rebuild babylon that's what they really the, babylon came later you know babylon in, in atlantis and feudalism and all that stuff in monarchy that came and killed pr- primitive communism people were getting along they were humanity was tribal and it was egalitarian and everyone lived off the land you know there was it was it was it was communism people lived in communes what changed everything was those pagan shaman who became tribal leaders like i explained the d- dawn of so- of satanism they started coveting you know the women and 
you know, originally their job was simply like the elders in a tribe were there to marry everybody. They were there to pick, you know, spouses for everybody because marriage has been around forever. Like there's always been marriage because even these primitive people, I mean, really primitive, I'm talking like the dawn of Homo sapiens, they've always known polygamy, not polygamy, because polygamy's developed later, but they've always known um, you need monogamy in marriage because you would have a guy who you need to know whose children, you need to know which children you're responsible for and you want a partner to have sex with, you don't want to be trading, you know, you don't want to be, be having sex with someone who's been used by everyone else. But unfortunately, there were people who were not picked in the tribe, you know, widows and the ones who had sex before marriage, they would not get picked. That's why marriage was... Um, needed because no one would mate with the people who were having too much sex and so you needed marriage to um what's the word you needed marriage to you needed marriage to facilitate safe sex and keeping track of your partner but as uh, as you know man became more um As man developed agriculture and started using currency instead of... They stopped being communistic and they started being capitalistic, um, using currency instead of bartering and instead of sharing and having a common resources. Um, men started gaining wealth and started coveting power and having hierarchy and they needed to start leaving their wealth to their ancestors, their their children. This was foreign before then. Everyone just kind of, the same way communists want to get rid of inheritance, uh, they didn't have inheritance in primitive communism. But, you know, the, the wealthy apex predators, the capitalists, I mean, they weren't really capitalists. Because it wasn't exactly capital. Um, but, you know, like the feudalist and the eventual monarchist. They needed... Wives became a mean... Instead, wives used to be your equal. In primitive communism, men and women were equal. They were separate. They had their own roles because that's just natural. And that's how you... <laughs> it's always going to be here. Traditional genders are always going to be here because that's how the species uh, goes on. But women started to be suppressed as patriarchy became capitalistic and a wife became a means of just creating heirs. That's what it's all about. And then that's when polygamy turned into something evil. I'm, I'm sure polygamy existed before then, but it became some, it became more about like concubines, like, like I said, just making heirs and also stunting on, uh, the, it became a, a status symbol. Like, oh, you only have one wife? <laughs> and I'm sure that's how child marriage developed. And really quick, Islam did not create those things. Islam doesn't even normalize or defend those things. These were things that were existing in the pre-Islamic Arab and Middle Eastern societies. Islam is, you know, Islam gave rules to all these pagan people. But of course, um, it, 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 it didn't like, um, what's the word? It doesn't condemn them, which bothers people. That's why, you know, child marriage and polygamy still continued for a long time. It didn't condemn those things because I it was just sort of a phase. They kind of knew the same way 
you know, Islam or no holy books condemn capitalism. But if you follow the morals of these, of this book, then those things just naturally go away. When I say like Muhammad, one, I'm not like a lot of these Salafists and fundamentalists who think Muhammad is some infallible man. They, they almost, they, they're almost pagan in the way that they hold Muhammad up as an equal to Allah. When, I mean, the man was poisoned by a Jewess. You know, like, what, are you going to tell me that he knew that was going to happen and that it was a good thing? No, he was a man. He was fallible. He could be fooled and tricked and mistaken. He was just, he had, you know, animal urges like all of us. And he tempered that with Islam. But, I mean, he still was a man of his people and times. And, yeah, I mean, there's nothing... Islam is not pro polygamy or child marriage, but it is, or even capitalism, but it is a, a, a moral guide to, um, to kind of correct societies doing those things. And I mean, really, you could argue possibly that the Quran does condemn those things because there's the part where they're condemning uh, the people of Lot, which is, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. And most people just take that as, oh, gays, tying back into the gay thing. Most Muslims interpret that as homosexuality is bad because that's how the Bible, you know, took it. But when you actually study everything we know like the actual concrete research of these people and their art and their customs and everything they were doing way more than gay sex and sodomy it was more rape and you know pedophilia and orgies and um you know public nudity all of, it's it's all of that it's all sexual deviancy and submitting to the flesh and i believe the child marriage thing that muhammad participated in was um in his mind the islamic um was was Isl was still islamic because it was you know it was marriage and he waited to i guess uh deflower the girl aisha but at the same time, if you are a Sunni, which at this stage I am a Sunni, I, I lean towards Sunni. I think the Sunni-Shiite split is silly. There's, there's only one, there's only being a Muslim, and you either do it right or wrong. In your beliefs, that's sort of, you know, either you're right or wrong. But if you're a Sunni, you believe Aisha essentially murdered um, Muhammad. It is possible that she helped him. No. I was going to say, if you're like a... It, it's her, it would be heretic, uh, heresy to say she helped him commit suicide. But that's that would be the argument of a Shiite. Is that, no, she, she was helping him kill himself. Well, that would be suicide. So you're insulting the Prophet and so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think Sunnism is correct. Everything we know says that Aisha killed him. And this is, this is basically the, the basis of Sunnism, is that Aisha killed her husband, Muhammad, not out of, like, hate, but out of loyalty to her father, because it was her father and his tribe of kind of, like, you know, the rich elders who um, were really kind of would gain the most and take over when Muhammad passed away and you know dictate the this, this this new group of Islam this new religion of Islam and this new very profitable kind of nation of Islam 
and it's believed that she she killed him to help her father succeed him and i mean that's a story old as time you've going back to the romans you'd hear about them killing their own favorite family member and elder to get power they, they believed it was just too important and i believe it's very possible just because you love and believe that muhammad was a perfect muslim does not mean that his wife would be a perfect muslim i mean these were people who were just new to this religion and she was what in her 20s you know she definitely could be corrupted by others it's true i mean satan is everywhere i believe muhammad would not be tricked by satan but the same way jesus was betrayed by people satan was controlling it's very possible and likely that Muhammad was betrayed by uh, his followers who were weak in faith. That's a nice segue into Andrew Tate. Um, you know, this guy's one of the most popular kind of right wing. I don't even know if he's right wing. Yeah, 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 he is. One of the most popular kind of um social media stars specifically in the kind of uh what they call the manosphere you know kind of just like male oriented social media um pro masculine as they call it red pill um anti feminist kind of stuff and of course he turned muslim while he was on while he was in prison or house arrest or whatever and He's starting to like, he did like a recent interview where he was explaining what he's learned from being Muslim and what, uh, why it's a great choice and all this. He said some controversial things that ruffled a lot of more conservative or as fundamentalist Muslims. Because I mean, it's, what does it mean? What does it say about modern Islam and, and it's how fundamentalist it, it's become when Andrew Tate is considered a friggin liberal reformer <laughs> but i mean the guy's a a new convert i don't think he's even been a muslim for a year so i mean he was kind of downplaying the fact that he's still a fornicator he hasn't given up totally having sex with you know random hussies of course it's going to take time as a convert i know it's not overnight and what matters is that you're improving, that you're doing less and less haram. And I mean, there are Muslims who've been Muslims all their life. They're still committing haram. All that matters is that you're progressing and you're not backsliding. But let's see, what did he get in trouble for? I think he said, uh, oh, for being, for saying he has gay friends. A lot of Muslims took umbrage with that. Let's let's be real here. There's nothing wrong with gay. There's nothing wrong. You're not bad for being gay. You're bad if you let homosexuality supersede spirituality. I mean, very seriously, it's it's materialism uh, conquering spirit, which is exactly what these people, you know, the people at the top want. And that's why they use gays. And they always have, especially you know, use gay sex to get us to follow the flesh and pleasure and not thinking about the future, not thinking about society, not thinking about kids, not thinking about, you know, reproduction or anything beyond f the flesh and fashion and being liked and narcissism. There are tons of gays who are not like that. And who are they? Muslims. Gay Muslims. They're, they're, I mean, we know that there have to be tons of gay Muslims throughout history. In fact, a lot of them have been chronicled as, you know, like, you know, within kind of like the, the, the golden age of Islam, a lot of the scholars and stuff were known to have gay sex. And I mean, because... When it's it's funny when you those times were considered liberal. Those were very liberal times, man. 
it was it was li Islam was more liberal at that period, and that's the Salafist. Their whole cause is believing that it's the liberalism of um, the Muslim golden age that did us in. When really it's way more complex than that. It was the fact Islam could not keep expanding militarily because they were used. It was cons it was controlled by Arabs who only knew how to fight in desert Middle Eastern. Um, territories they should have to blame the caliphate they should have converted you know sub-saharan africans and europeans and central asians before trying to engage in military conquest you know turn build armies there who know how to fight that's that's how they you know yeah that just would have worked you know, it's, it's the Arab, the kind of pan-Arab nature of um, the Middle East that has always done in Islam. It's not Islam itself. Islamic doctrine is perfect. It's Arabs. I hate to say that, but it's it's always been Arab failure. I mean, that's part of the Quran. It tells you, like, oh, we've given this book to the the dirty, crazy Arabs because they we wanted to <laughs> allow... And this is an angel talking to Muhammad. It's like, we've given in, uh, Islam to the Arabs because they are so wretched and so corrupt that they need it the most. And it's we'll make the best example by saving these people. And I mean, what what's done Arabs and Pakistanis and all these groups in and, you know, Persians and all, is that they've kept, so much of them have kept their pre-Islamic customs which are totally, you know, heretical and pagan and, like I've said, materialist and all about the flesh and totally racist. They're so... People talk about Africans and Asians and Europeans. Man, the Middle Eastern people, they're, they're one race. They're their own race. Semitic people are their own race. But no race hates each other more than the Semitic people, the Middle Eastern people, they, before Islam, oh my God, they were just, oh, even with Islam, they're still, they can't get on the same page. So imagine how bad it was before Islam. But I mean, they actually did work together and have really great peace and um, just beautiful kind of building of like a monoculture that influenced everyone surrounding them because of Islam, but eventually they became too spread out and they stopped working together as a caliphate and started, you know, falling back into monarchy and nationalism and ethno-nationalism and, you know, preserving my, you know, my old culture. That's how you get Wahhabism, totally, totally. And that is the origin of the Sunni Shiite split. The the Shi the Shiites are totally ruled. I'm sorry, sorry. The um, I've been saying it backwards. The it's the 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 uh, the Sunnis who are so corrupt. The Sunnis who you know were dictated by kind of the upper class anti-democratic elites within the Muslim community who really just converted for um, to avoid war. And they, they didn't really have any spiritual means. They weren't siding with the masses. I have to, have to re-explain the Sunni Shia thing because I, I apologize for really, because for, confusing the two words will really um, mess people up. It'll offend Muslims and it'll really confuse non-Muslims. The the Shiites are the ones who believe Aisha killed uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the Sunnis, who are the vast majority of Muslims, were ruled by the people who um, capitalized and put their own people in and... They 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 said that they feared 
they didn't want a kind of democratic most muslims wanted the prophet muhammad's family to take over uh ali his I believe nephew and the I believe like a son-in-law at the same time they wanted ali to take over instead this elite kind of dictator not you know dictators but this elite kind of republic within islam the wealthy families who, you know who had like political power and they decided well no we're going to put someone in who we think will uh, be stronger and will essentially listen to us and serve our interests which is basically just conquest uh, wealth and military conquest instead of someone who was a who knew the religion that was Ali and eventually Ali did become caliph but you know he faced opposition and you know eventually this led to the Sunni Shiite split but at a certain point Shiites even became not corrupted but they lost their way when it became they became dominated by the Twelver Shiite movement, which believes, I think I've already explained, possibly, I'm, I think I'm, no, I don't think I explained, I think it was part of that podcast I, that didn't record. The Twelver Shiites, their whole mission, not their mission, but their view on things is that there have been 12 great imams who have followed the Prophet Muhammad and they have all been related to the Prophet Muhammad and the twelfth has not appeared yet. He's essentially uh, the Messiah, the Muslim Messiah. So what are you doing here? The twelve or Shiites are basically practicing Zionism. They're not practicing Zionism, but they're following Jews and Christian beliefs. They're adapting to that. They're corrupting their religion because they're so desperate and so marginalized that they've had to create this kind of um, hope and fantasy just like the Jews did just like the Christians did of a returning savior and they believe the Mahdi this 12th Imam will be related to the Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad and he might even be a reincarnation of the Prophet Muhammad and I mean he's going to he will arrive when the Dajjal the Middle Eastern or the Arabic yeah I think Middle Eastern I don't think it, I think it predates Arabic but the Dajjal is the Muslim version of the Antichrist the Mashiach Lucifer the Jewish Messiah and like once the Dajjal takes over this false Messiah then Jesus will come back and then the Mahdi will come back and they're gonna tag team and take down the Antichrist so it's basically just Christian and Jewish Zionism. It's the same Revelations fantasy just adapted by these Shiites. And what's crazy is that it's become this 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 belief. Yeah, I did explain this when I talked about the Saudis and the Wahhabis. They it's the fun it's the foundational excuse that the Wahhabists and the Saudis use for, you know, ruling the the holy land saudi arabia they they believe that they the saudis are the mahdi family that the mahdis will come from their uh camp because of some total ridiculous uh pr prophecy omen um created by misinterpreting a unsubstantiated quote from the prophet muhammad so no first off no muslim should even take this as like literal gospel or literal you know islamic um fact or conviction but if you're a sunni you should totally reject it because this is all coming from shiite um fanfic essentially 12 verse shiite fanfic not even mainstream orthodox shiite um scholarship i suppose Yet, Wahhabists, you know, yet the Saudis and Wahhabists are pushing this Salafism, which teaches this 12 Shiite legend 
to all Muslims who are not even 12 or Shiites. That's what's that's that's how you, you can debunk their whole of you can debunk Wahhabism. Their whole thing, Salafism, is rejecting every innovation in Islam that's come after the first generation. Then that means you friggin' reject 12 or Shiiteism. That you don't believe anything except the Quran. That that's that's but how can so many Muslims fall for that? Because the vast majority of Muslims are illiterate. You know, Muslims have fallen back so hard, and it's not because they were too liberal. It's because actually it is. It's because they were too liberal to outsiders. They were they let all these Westerners in to their culture. And Westerners bastardized, plagiarized, and conspired within to destroy them. And they betrayed them. They betrayed the Muslims for centuries. I mean, many, many times they've betrayed Muslims for Muslims just being too nice and peaceful. That's the irony. We are depicted as like this warlike people, invaders. And it's the opposite. We've been too trusting and nice. And that's always been our downfall is that our jihad has always been internal instead of uh, warlike. And I mean, oh, it's, that's, that's a whole other conversation to pick up on. But the, the, we need to reject Mahdiism, as I, I like to call it. The idea of the Mahdi is so toxic. I've met so many Muslims from the Middle East who believe in it. Because they think it's like, oh, this is some fundamental stuff that's going to protect us from Western liberalism. Western Muslim liberalism. No, the Mahdi, the, the stuff about every frigging insane kind of sect of like modern sect of Islam that's been like Zionist or essentially a cult. They're usually, it's usually blamed on Sufism. Like, oh, it's the, you know, Muslims will say Sufism is evil. It's pagan. It's, it's heretical. It's, it's 12 or Shiitism. It's not just being Sufist. Sufist just means like, you're a, a a Muslim who practices uh, spiritual enlightenment and not just following the physical, you know, rituals and rules, but you actually attain and seek spiritual enlightenment through Islam. And Sufis are actually a, a long chain of. Uh, e imams and scholars who can trace their uh, tutelage through all the way back to people who studied under Muhammad like their teachers teacher there's a teacher's teacher was you know um, a companion of Muhammad they're considered like um, if you're if they're if you're Shiite they're considered like the next best thing to um, Muhammad's dynasty, which I guess would be the Ayatollah, right? Or, and if you're a Sunni, then they are, if you're a Sunni Sufi, then a Sufi uh, imam or scholar is considered the, the best um, authority on Islam, that is. Even though like most of the imams who have favor and popularity and authority and have the most Muslims listening to them are not Sufi at all because Wahhabists have turned everyone against Sufism. Modern Muslims are so materialist and death obsessed and all about the world and so many are all about money and like I said, liberalism. They're totally divorced from Sufism, which... I mean, if you go back 200, 300 years, I think, or at least in certain parts, when, when, when Islam, there was a time when most Muslims were Sufist, were Sufist. Yeah, because of course, there was a time when most uh, Imams and Muftis were actually could trace their lineage to the Prophet Muhammad. And that's becoming less and less, which is a very scary, scary thing. But when you look at the nation of Islam or these uh, 
all these weird kind of like Indian and Pakistani um, sects who it seems like every 10 years there's some new leader who's like, I am the Mahdi. I am a reincarnation of, of uh, Muhammad. And what do you know? I have my own book. Like, you know, they, they, they try to build on Islam and say that there's a new chapter of Islam and I think that's where the Druze come from, I believe. But this, that is, that in itself, if you believe that, that there is a Mahdi, then you are opening Islam to paganism and Zionism and heresy. Because it, the thing that makes Islam special is that it is, it claims to be the final religion with the final prophet and the final holy text. So that's why you can't believe in a Mahdi because every time you believe in a Messiah, you're opening up the religion to paganism and 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 uh, innovations. Now, that is essentially what Muhammad was to Judeo-Christianity, but Judeo-Christianity never said that they were the final. They never, they never sealed their religion. What do I mean by that? Because Jews, their entire foundational belief is in a Messiah coming to, you know, help them. The, the, their whole thing is that they're waiting for their God as man to come and save them. That's the paganism of it. That's the Satanism of it. And that is what the Christians believe. They believe that... God as a man is coming to save them. So they're waiting for a Messiah. Islam does not believe that. We do not believe that someone's coming to save us, that God is going to come through a man, that God can be anything other than God, and that man can have any of that kind of power like that. The Prophet Muhammad was not a God. You can believe that the Jewish Messiah will be Lucifer. You can believe that Jesus was Lucifer or that Jesus was God, but we don't believe that Prophet Muhammad was God. We don't believe that Jesus was God. We don't believe in a Jewish Messiah or any Messiah. There is no Messiah. Twelve or Shiites essentially believe a messian, a messian, uh, messianic version of Islam, which is by itself not Islam. That's why all of these so-called Sufi sects cults keep springing up they're not they're just 12 or shiite sects they're not even sufi really it's a it's a misuse of the word sufi in summary sufi sects are not in themselves uh, heretical and or even um messianic believing in a mahdi is what's wrong. Twelver Shiitism is wrong. Just as wrong as the Sunnis are, in my opinion. You know, an Orthodox, an Orthodox Shiite should not be a Twelver or believe in a Mahdi. And an Orthodox, an Orthodox Muslim, if you, even if you don't identify as a uh, Shiite, is, you, you should especially not believe in a Mahdi. Why can't Muslims believe in a Messiah? Because believing in a Messiah, like Jews and Christians, leads to more holy books and prophets. False prophets, that is. Example, Jews essentially created Christ. They, and that is um, a good thing, just because, you know, eventually it led to more and more clarity. Each, all of these religions... Like I've said, Satanism is the oldest religion, the oldest pagan religion. All we've done, because Islam is the correct application, the first correct and perfect, it's, it's the only time we've gotten it right, religion right. So everything that's come before has been pagan and satanic. It's just been less and less. Like Judaism, almost there. Christianity, oh, so close. And then finally, Islam. But Jew, Judaism and Christianity, 
they are satanic. They are pagan. And, you know, Christ was the promised son of Israel, but not the Messiah. You know? Here, this is where Jews and Muslims agree, you know, that Jesus was not the Messiah. But if Muslims don't believe in more um, prophets to come, like Jews and Christians, we can't be open to Ahmadi or... Um, or a returning Jesus, or allow a Dajjal to welcome either a Mahdi or Jesus. You know, this is a Zionist trick by the Satanists to um, tempt Muslims away from their uh, religion, to see who actually knows their religion, because most of them are just following paganism. Like I said, when Saudi government, there are ideology and everything it's just pure paganism they let everyone practice satanic pagan religions like christmas and uh halloween they have all seeing eyes and triple sixes everywhere pyramid worship you know jesus claimed to be the messiah of the jews or at least you know not so much messiah is the wrong word Jesus claimed to be the prophet, the next prophet or final prophet of the Jews. And Satanists convinced Jews that, you know, he was not that king of Israel, uh, Lucifer, but the Antichrist, that the Antichrist would be their uh, Messiah and that Satan is their God. That's what, that's what they did. They con Satanist convinced the Jews that that their Messiah would be the Antichrist and that Satan is their God that Yahweh is really God Yahweh is really Satan the God of these Romans who of course were uh, above and enslaving Jews and had slaves it had the Jews finally become their uh, pawns they convinced them that, you know, Satan's son is the Luciferian Messiah and that he's uh, the opponent of Christ. And so if, if they want to, they must do the opposite of Christians if they want to summon and please the Moshiach or Moloch, the pagan god that they served before, um, you know, that is one of the one of the pagan gods that the Hebrews served before uh, Moses, because Moses is a monotheist prophet, just like Jesus was. It's the Jews themselves that are pagan and fallen because they did not listen to Moses and didn't listen to Jesus, just like the Christians didn't truly listen to Jesus. They did not follow monotheism like Jesus preached because they've allowed their religion to become corrupted into paganism and the Trinity. In both groups, Jews and Christians have allowed this monotheistic God of their prophets to have, you know, the, the, the pagan God of Satan kind of um, linked to their monotheistic God. They're worshiping God and Satan at the same time. And you know this to be true because, you know, one, Jew, Christians believe that Satan is somehow equal to God. In fact, both Jews and Christians believe that Satan is equal to God and that there's some kind of, well, the Jews believe that Satan is equal to God and they're both kind of like twin gods. Christians believe that they are not working together, but they're still competing. The God and the devil are competing, and God will win. And it's us Muslims. We're the only ones who believe God has already won. That Satan is not even, he's not an equal. He's just another, he rules. He doesn't even rule. He, he doesn't rule the lower realms. He just is there. He, he's there as a, a tempter for God. He as like a false opposition. Jews and Christians are lost because they, 
they they're monotheistic. They claim to be monotheistic, but their god is pagan. You know, Satan has always been their god because they've never been truly monotheistic. You know, Moses preached monotheism. Jews went and worshipped, you know, their previous pagan gods and money and Moloch and Set, you know, <laughs> who was, you know, Satan, you know, Set was above them even in Egyptian times. That's Set has always sort of been uh, the the basis for Yahweh. I mean, when you really look at it, Judaism is essentially against their own God. They don't know because Set was the God of their oppressors and, you know, Lucifer, Anubis, he was the God that was, I believe it's Anubis, he was the Messiah who's going to rescue them from this evil God, Set. You know, essentially the devil is their God and their Messiah is uh, this angel who's going to save them from this evil god. So if you're an Orthodox Jew, you believe that Satan is God and that the Messiah is going to save you from the, your, your satanic god. And that's exactly what Islam is. It is Allah, the one true god, using a man to teach the true interpretation of their own stories so they can be free from this satanic delusion and that you know this 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 false god satan that they've been tricked into serving but it was so easy for satanists to get jews to revert to satanism once Moses was gone. It was so easy for them to get Christians to revert to Satanism once Christ was gone. Because by tricking them into worshipping Mashiach, Moloch, as much as Yahweh, their so-called, you know, the God of Moses, and getting Christians to worship um, their Messiah, Jesus, as much as they're, mon they're as much as Jesus is God, uh, Jehovah. And it's because Yahweh and Jehovah, they're both just incorrect interpretations and names for God. Allah. Allah is the name. Even though I've heard that in the, the language that Jesus would have spoken... Yeshua bin Joseph is apparently Jesus' real name. The, the language he would have used, he would have used Allah as God. So I like to say Allah, Allah like, instead of Allah, just Allah really quickly. Because that's apparently the name Jesus would have called his God. You know, Yahweh or Jehovah, that's, that's Satan playing Allah. Uh, Lucifer, Christ, that's Satan playing Allah. Something really interesting about the three Abrahamic religions, all three of them believe that Lucifer and Satan are the same. It's just how much do you ascribe God to one or both of those figures? Because in Satanism, Lucifer and Satan are the same. To Luciferians, they are different. Because the Satanists, of course, are above and fooling Luciferians, who are essentially just like New Agers, Freemasons, and, when you really think about it, Jews. Jews are basically Luciferians. And Christians, I'm not being anti-Semitic, it's both of them. They're both Luciferian, Satanic religions. You know, Jews see Lucifer and Satan as dual gods. You know, Satan is Yahweh, Lucifer is Moloch. And Christians see them as a trinity. They see Satan is Jehovah, Lucifer is Jesus, and, you know, Allah, God, is you. And that all three are the same, you know. Satan, Lucifer, and you, you're all God. You know, that's the trinity of it. The, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we Muslims 
the you know I guess you know the final you know just just uh, because it's a uh, uh, it's it, it, chronologically we're you know more advanced. We were, Muhammad came so much later; he could process all of the knowledge and and plot holes of you know Judeo Christianity and see how they were not that different from paganism and where they were limited. I'm sure he knew about Buddhism because I mean here's a guy in the middle of uh, uh, was it Mecca. I believe it's Mecca. So he was, he was like a, he was like a middle class guy, merchant, in all these markets. This is this there was a, this is where all the different peoples cross paths. All these different religions cross paths, and all these different peoples brought all their customs and traded and would visit the Kaaba. Um, so he was well versed in all these religions and studying them and deciphering and trying to figure out his own spirituality. And it blew his mind because he learned just like all the prophets before him, he, he was understanding a spiritual truth when no one else did. And that's why it gave him all these crazy, you know, outer body experiences and extrasensory perception because you're you're attaining a psycho a psychic connection to the divine truth of the universe in a in a dark lower vibrational time where just about everyone is believing nonsense and tons of people are committing sacrifices and all this insanity so to to attain that high vibrational uh yeah the high vibration would be shattering it would be like uh, it would be like a, a, a it would be like a shock to your system and also a shock to the the physical plane around you i i don't know how much recorded just then i the app messed up again i didn't press the right button uh but you know i'm going to reiterate jews believe in a dual god satan and lucifer christians see a trinity, you know, Jehovah, or sorry, Satan, Lucifer, and you, as you're all three God. We Muslims see one God. There's nothing outside of Allah that is on Allah's level. Satan isn't God. Lucifer isn't God. They're the same thing. They're both, a, it's both a trick, a fantasy, you know. Neither one is God, and they're both the deceiver. <laughs> you know, Jesus isn't God. Muhammad isn't God. Neither should be worshipped in the same breath as God. <laughs> and to attain that knowledge, to like, that blew Muhammad's mind. You have to think like that. Like, just like every prophet before him, they were attaining spiritual knowledge from just studying this crazy pantheon of pagan religion, which was all kind of controlled and meant you know it was all kind of corrupted and used to control them to decipher that would would give you high vibration it would be a, it would it would be such a high vibrational experience that it would shift the the physical plane around you because you're living in a world that's all about you know low vibrational energy and murder and sacrifice and deception and control so to Im imagine you, you, you're the final prophet, that means you're attaining the most spiritual knowledge, the most contact with the, high, with the, the divine. You're the first person to really, you're the, you're the closest person to talk to God, essentially. Through an angel, apparently. So, of course, Muhammad had all of these outer body experiences and clairvoyance and extrasensory perception. He was apparently like seeing angel. He could see the angel that was talking to him. He could hear him. He was, you know, kind of transported um, through the heavens, like riding on like this, this strange kind of like angelic horse being angel thing. <laughs> 
you know that's what took him to heaven and is you know and it's that's a huge part of our religion and it's like how can you believe that this man traveled from mecca to medina or whatever how, how could he have traveled in one night uh, thousands of miles or through heaven and it's like sp he did it spiritually he didn't do it physically i mean this is religion we're talking about you have to believe in a more than the physical more than the physical body that's the whole precipice within the precipice the whole premise of, of of spirituality is that this physical stuff is just an illusion man it's a temporary distraction it's the soul body that's eternal and that's really existing in reality but we look at the luciferians and the satanists i don't know if it recorded but luciferians are under the satanists they're totally controlled and by luciferians there are people who are straight up luciferian satanists they know what that they're luciferian satanists and there are christians and jews who are luciferian satanists and don't even know it but the luciferians they also believe that lucifer and satan are one and they think that you know lucifer is uh you know, Lucifer and Satan are, are equal. But true Satanists, the people who, the, you know, the oldest, the old time religion, as they say, they don't believe that, you know, anyone, they believe in God and Satan. They know what's up. They know Satan is Lucifer, just like we Muslims know. Satan and Lucifer are the same. Lucifer fell and became Satan. What they believe is that God is God and God is in control, but Satan will overthrow God because they project their own wicked human desires onto Satan. You know, the Luciferians believe that there's good and bad God, Lucifer and Satan. They're just two halves of God. Oh, gosh. No, man. God is good God is above good and evil. Satan is nothing. Satan is just an agent of God. He, he does the bad and the prophets do the good. You know, it's, it's, it's wild. It's Satanists who push this lie throughout all religion that Satan is the opponent of God and that he will beat God. And they've never been monotheistic, ever. They've always been against monotheistic. Because they've always known that there's one true God. They've always just served the, the lower beings and the lower deities. Because if you betray God and serve them, you get quicker results. You get materialistic results, lower vibrational uh, rewards. Because these are primitive people, man. <laughs> you know they were primitive people they started out worshiping animals before they started worshiping god and then they worked their way up to man <laughs> that's why it's so conditioned and natural for men to worship man as god and worship snakes as god because they're just we're low vibrational people man we're low vibrational creatures we're not as low as the demons and satanists which prey on us that's what that's why they're even bigger predators on us <laughs> and it's possible that they're even more lost and cut off from god than us because you know they're like sharks man they just they just do their job which is feeding off us and you know tempting us and making us destroy ourselves because yes they are these lower beings the jinn they are they they resent and hate us kind of like animals like like animals not all animals really predators like predator animals resent other animals because they they're stuck being these meat eating like just lower beings spiritually and they hate the the higher beings the prey who are just kind of innocent and spiritually connected to God and peaceful. Like, you know, yeah, animals aren't below us. Some are and some aren't. And, you know, it's, it's, it's weird to me that 
we're and that's what's what's kind of sad is that we're allowed to eat the predator it's like why are we even the quran agrees we're allowed to eat some animals the the nicer kinder prey animals and it's like why you know the buddhist and he's like why are we allowed to eat the nice animals why can't we eat the, the the asshole predator animals one they're bad like you eat bush meat and you get sick and die because they're predators <laughs> same reason you don't eat people but it's also because them being prey them being the sheep just like the bible talks about th- them being prey is what keeps them good them being prey keeps them from being predators and it's like us being humans that keeps us from being demons but then you look what happens as soon as people become predators they become susceptible and controlled slaves of that lowest being satan you know what i mean we call him the prince of darkness i'm not so sure i mean yes let's see he went from the light to the darkness lucifer to satan but he's both at the same time because he uses that image of light and good to trick us he uses that image of of the the betrayed blonde haired blue eyed white hermaphrodite gorgeous creature which is an angel the being of pure light he uses that to trick us because that is an illusion the idea that angels are better than humans is the illusion they are i mean that's that's why lucifer was cast out of heaven for thinking oh i'm this beautiful hermaphrodite uh white woman thing i you're telling me i'm i'm lower than these dark fucking monkey people you know he's the first white supremacist he's the first faggot (laughs) and it's it's the truth man it's the truth it's the truth and i mean it's not he's not even a a man or a woman that's the thing and and that's because you know men and women are equally good and equally evil and angels show us this you know the angels and the jinn they're not even that different they are really kind of the same creatures they just have it inhabit different planes of existence you know the jinn are made of fire i believe and the, the angels are made of light and man is made of dirt and earth it's true we come from the earth we come from lightning striking the 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 muddy waters <laughs> and some would say that's satan being cast out of heaven and it's possible because just like even luciferians and satanists believe that lucifer that that we he's in us that that psychedelic goat being that you see when you trip on acid that's in everybody it's it's a part of all of us and it's like it's like he took lucifer like oh you 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 hate these people i'm gonna make them from you i'm gonna and i'm gonna i'm gonna let you uh tempt them and envy them and you can you can you can take the ones who you know who you hate and you can get them to serve you the ones who but they're the ones like you the ones who serve you because they're weak are just like you you're the king of these people that you hate because they're just like you they they have the same weakness and evil that i put into you it's like a lesson it's like we are a lesson here to evil which is lucifer and it's like Allah must have put that in Lucifer for a reason. He's like, I'm going to make you this narcissistic, greedy, selfish, uh, jealous creature to show everyone uh, why it's wrong. Like, just like the story says, even no matter how you interpret the story of the fall, which is really kind of the beginning of the abrahamic it, it's the literal beginning of the abrahamic uh religion no matter how you look at the fall because it's it's a reinterpretation of satanism it's the luciferian interpretation of satanism no matter how you look at the fall 
he Lucifer Satan is this spoiled brat just like Cain and you know from who killed his brother the child the children of Adam and Eve man it's in man to follow we follow that that and some would Luciferians would believe we literally came to this physical universe because we all followed Satan out of heaven and it's it seems like it yeah God cast Lucifer out and he he led all these souls down here he was the first cast out and we all were cast out because we all have that same evil in us and you can either understand why and thank God for making an example of us because it shows us by showing us our evil it allows us to see our good and cultivate our good and minimize our evil and defeat evil or you can just be like Satan and be not be like Satan be like Lucifer and just ungrateful and turn into Satan and want to corrupt others and bring them down to your level but I mean eventually when the job is done Satan and Satan I guess has collected enough souls or he's brought enough good souls back to heaven eventually Satan will return to the heavens and you know all the p people that followed him into hell they will burn not eternal you know most Muslims would agree this is where we disagree with the Jews and the yeah the Jews and the Christians we don't believe that you just go to hell and it's over you just suffer down there forever first off the Jews believe that only they go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell Christians believe only they go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell we believe everyone goes to heaven Muslims and people who are um, Muslim like who follow the same morals of Allah as Muslims they will go to heaven first and everyone else the sinners they will go to hell first and there they will be burned for their sins and they will learn from Satan what they did wrong and they will pay for it their sins will be thrown down upon them and these levels of hell these different levels of suffering it's it's like the long you know the different the lower you go the more you have to suffer and the more you have to learn and that is I mean that is I mean even the Hindus and the Buddhists believe that they believe before you can reach some kind of enlightenment and spiritual rest and a, a you know nirvana first you have to go through this karmic wheel and pay for all your sins and they believe it's reincarnation like oh it's just like different lives yeah you can look at that you can look at it as like a different life but it's really it's still the afterlife you're dead each time you when you die you're going to um a hell where you're gonna pay and it's like i guess their interpretation is like maybe this world is is really hell and we're just it's like a matrix and we're we're paying right now like there is no because that's the belief is there is no real hell this world is hell this is where you learn and everyone's going to go to heaven that is the luciferian doctrine that is the biggest lie that there is that no matter what you do you're going to go to heaven no matter you can fuck kids murder people it doesn't matter you're going to go to heaven because this world is hell and we're all god just get the f out of here <laughs> all right people thank you for listening don't let the snakes and the whores and the narcissists and the hermaphrodites <laughs> you know the gender backwards people and you know the snowflakes and the weak and the predators and the self uh, victimizers uh, don't let any of them distract you and corrupt you and lead you away from heaven 
even animals. I mean, animals, of course, are not, they're not bad, but they're not, they're not, what's the word, worshiping them or having too much sympathy for them to the point where you become like them and become a victim and become prey. That is, that is negative. Animals are not, of course, animals aren't evil. They don't go to hell, but they, they are less positive than us. I wouldn't say less valuable or less sentient or less, maybe they are less sentient. I don't know. But I think, I don't think so. I think that they know that they also, their souls have a karmic debt when they come down here. Like they were souls created in heaven just like us and they'll probably return to heaven and be animals and in heaven. I don't really believe that reincarnation is animals and stuff, as humans and stuff. But they know they came down here with a purpose, which is to be less moral. It's the truth. Animals are less moral. And they're an example that we can either follow or learn from. We should be kind to animals. We should be sympathetic to them. We should protect them and not be cruel. But we should also know that they are here to serve our survival. And it's like, that doesn't mean being a predator to them. It means um, just loving, loving and preserving ourselves because we serve God more than they do. You know, they serve the planet. You know, they poop and reproduce and provide meat and stuff like that. But they don't serve God. Only man does. Only man has the capacity to. Most, let's just be real. Like I said, 85% of people, um, you know, it's more than that. It's, you know, it's it's 95% of people are here, are less than animals. 95% of people are literally here just to... Uh, take they don't give back they don't worship god but that doesn't mean that you treat them like animals that doesn't mean that you treat another person like food like satanists do literally yeah man most men are just cattle but you should respect the cattle you should respect cattle the same way <laughs> the hindus do but they take it to an extreme. They hold, they worship cattle as holy as like gods. That is the most pagan and idiotic religion that there is. And that's why maybe Hindus are the most averse to Islam, the most averse to progress and <laughs> civilization. Total snake charmers the literal inventors of the caste system and, you know, institutionalized racism. And who are the Indians? They are whew, getting real here. First off, they're just black people that, you know, left. <laughs> and I mean, look at them. You look at like the, the you, there's almost no physical difference between like a dark skin Indian, except for they have flattened hair. Because, the you know, the crinkly hair happened later as Africa got hotter and hotter as the Ice Age ended. They, uh, the original black man looked like Indians. You know, dark skin Indians. But they mated with the Neanderthals, these godless, you know, pagan people who didn't believe in monogamy or anything they were just bloodthirsty cave beings 
pale skinned cave beings from snowier parts of the world. Or not even snowier, just jungle parts. The, Europe was like a jungle. Uh, it was totally dark and rainy. And so they, you know, got zero light. You know, these Neanderthals mixed with Homo sapiens, and that is how we got, uh, you know, the modern human. And there's no better example than the Indians. It's, it's all right there. It's all right there. Their culture shows just the schism between light and dark and right and wrong and uh, hate and love. And it's, you know, it's kind of, you can see it everywhere. They were just sort of like the first because they would be the first ones to leave Africa and meet the damn Neanderthals. And it's funny when you look at their mythology, which is really just kind of like primitive uh, telling folklore of history. They believe that, uh, you know, their version of vampires in the story of Lilith is that, you know, man created Lilith. She was the original mate for Adam. She was evil and she left and had sex with Satan and birthed all of these like dark skinned vampire people. So it's like a total racist legend, but it's also um, an alternative version of Eden and the fall from heaven. You know, Lucifer is Lilith, you know, their version, they're two separate beings, Satan and Lucifer. Like Satan is her mate and she is the fallen a uh, woman of, uh, I guess, the God-man. <laughs> That's their whole thing, you know, because they're pagan. They believe man is some god. L Lucifer was his mate who left, and Satan is the guy who took her. A trinity. And that is literally... That is literal Satanism. A, a satanic trinity with three gods and... Look at the morality of that. You're holding righteousness equal to, you know, uh, attempt, you know, uh, uh, you're holding righteousness as equal to um, the deceiver and this neutral woman that's between who loves both. You know, it's it's total primitive morality projected onto um deities and we wonder why narcissism this in this inherited ingrained psychology in society is all about like you know simps and you know it's, it's really about women kind of loose women with no morality triangulating between you know the kind of the the alpha thug who mistreats her but and and the the simp who white knight who's always trying to fight for her and you see that so much in everything it's it's in every freaking story it's in every romantic story it's in every you know superhero story the damsel in distress the good and evil light and dark fighting over her and it's you know it's become like a metaphor for God and Satan fighting over your soul and it's bullshit because there's no there's no e there's no question there's no equality between good and evil that in itself is the illusion the man-made illusion so yeah baby we're going in thank you Allah for opening our eyes and the thing the thing about being spiritual is just thanking Allah for every positive moment and even thanking Allah for every negative moment because it is an opportunity to return to the light and the good I don't really like the terminology of light and dark but you know what I mean it comes from it's so steep in that primitive religion where they worship the sun because the sun 
obviously was creating life, but they didn't, I guess some people, one religion would see how the light was good and the other religion would see how the dark was good. They're both good and bad. There's darkness and there's evil to light and there's, there's good to evil. And there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's darkness to light and there's lightness to dark and there's good to evil and there's evil to good and you can't be an extremist it's all it's all good and i don't mean it in the satanic do what thou will you know there's no real morality i mean it's all a laws it's a law has per this is where the occultists misinterpret spiritual morality just because God created everything, just because God allows and permits everything, does not mean God wants you to do everything. It doesn't mean God is responsible for every bad thing that happens. God just knows everything that we're going to do because Allah is God. He's, of course, he knows he created us with the knowledge of everything that we're going to do, but we decided that. He created us, gave us free will, and he's just like, uh, you know, I'm a super genius. I see where it's going to end up. You think that you're going to overthrow me or that you mm, replace me, but I'm God. I created you. You're never going to, you know, usurp me. And it's just like humanity has to let go of that delusion that luciferian delusion that we are greater than god that just because we have souls that it that they and just because we have eternal souls that they can't be punished by the the creator of these souls because we all are just parts of that original creative energy and everything is it's not just us we're not the only thing that matters you know animals and the insects have just as much sentience and energy as a blade of grass or a rock or the air you know getting into like some native american type stuff the problem is native americans use that as some kind of pluralistic paganism like everything is god no not everything is god god created everything you have a child that child isn't you you know, it's like, maybe that's a bad example because it takes two to make a child. God, everything comes from one. But the thing is, we are not that one. We are derivatives of that one. And that's what you got to remember. Yes, there is only one. We need a one world government. We need a one world religion. But based on the most high, the creator, the original, the number one, the first the first and the last of everything. So, yeah. <laughs> On that note, peace, people.